I don't think there'll be any problems hearing me. I've been called the human microphone before, but uh, if there are any problems, just let me know. So we're talking about the myths and facts about PR and fundraising, and we're going to go through the myths, and I just want to let everybody know these are things we've actually heard from clients or people we've met with over the years. We had a lot of fun in the office narrowing down the myths that we thought would be helpful for you here today. There are were, there were more that didn't make the cut. Um, but, but first, a little bit of uh, introduction. Uh, I'm a former journalist, started in radio and TV news, so we'll be talking about media here today. Um, the last 15 years I've been in the PR agency business. Uh, we started our firm in 2007. I was at another firm before that in management and ownership. So nonprofits have been clients for the last 15 years. And generally speaking, nonprofits are very good PR clients. Because unless you tell your story and deliver your message, you're going to have a really hard time sustaining your mission. So PR and nonprofits go hand in hand. If we can bridge this gap between the facts and the myths we're going to talk about today. Uh, as you heard in my introduction, I'm proud to serve as a nonprofit board member here in the community, currently chairing a fundraising campaign and have worked as a counsel on capital campaigns. So let's start with the first myth. We hear this one a lot. We have a great cause, so we're going to attract a lot of press, and that press is going to help us raise a lot of money because we have a great cause. Anybody heard that one before? Well, here's the truth. To someone, they're all great causes. So just having a great cause is not enough. And I've met with people who work inside of nonprofits, and they bang their head against the wall, and they say, how come this organization got attention? Our cause is so much better than theirs. Well, I think the, great, the goodness or greatness of the cause is in the eye of the beholder. And something I really want to emphasize today is that just having a great cause is not enough. Because I'm going to work under the assumption right now that all of you who are in the room who are representing nonprofits and charities, you all have great causes. Let's just get that out of the way right now. What you do about that and how you communicate that and how PR can work for you in different ways is what I hope we're going to get into together today. So I'm going to go through the myths and the truths, and then I hope to get some questions from you along the way and then at the end so that you can walk away from here with some things you can actually think about when you get back to the office. So here's another myth we hear a lot. We need a lot of press releases to tell our story. A lot of nonprofits come to us and say, we need your help with press releases. And for whatever reason, people who've never worked in PR and don't really know anything about sophistication of communications, they know what a press release is. And they've been taught somewhere along the way that a press release is important. Well, it's a myth that you need a lot of press releases to tell your story. In fact, some of our most successful efforts we've achieved on behalf of clients, we haven't even done a press release. Press release was never even in the equation. So the truth is that press releases are one communications tool of many, of more than I could even list here this morning. And they're often unnecessary. That's the truth. The other truth is that a press release is not a piece of currency that buys you news coverage. For some reason, there's this myth out there that if you have a press release, you're going to take that to a journalist, and that somehow is part of a transaction that will result in news coverage. It doesn't work that way. A uh, press release can be a very good way to get all of your facts and messages in an organized fashion on one piece of paper or one screen in the electronic world. What happens after that is variable, depending on the situation, but it doesn't guarantee you anything. And the truth of the matter is you don't need to hire somebody to write a lot of press releases. If you're writing a lot of press releases, you're probably not spending your time too effectively. Another myth we hear a lot, and we say, if we call it, they will come. Let's do a press conference. Let's hold and schedule a press conference. And if we have this press conference and we let the media know, the media will come and they'll cover our press conference and we'll have news. That's a myth we hear a lot. I think it comes from the movies and the political world where somebody you know, stamps their, their fist on the table and says, we're going to call a press conference and that'll fix everything. Well, it's not, not how it works. In fact, the truth is that press conferences are rare. They should be rare. And for journalists, they're last resort. So I can tell you that when I worked in news, and this is going back a couple of decades ago, we would only cover the press conference if that was the only way to get the story. 
We would much rather get the story another way, through a one-on-one -on -one interview, through a phone interview, some other type of access. We would only cover the press conference if, if, you know, if we had to be there at 10.30 to get the story, we would do it as a last resort. Uh, I can tell you that we as a firm representing clients in nonprofits, for-profits, public companies, private companies, professional services, we very rarely have anything to do with a press conference. Happened to be last week, I worked on one at Mackin Island, um, working with the Detroit Regional Chamber with Jeb Bush and Governor Snyder. If you have Jeb Bush and Governor Snyder at your event, you might need to do a press conference. Otherwise, there are much more effective ways of getting the media's attention and getting your story told. Here's another myth, very similar to the first one I put out, but a little bit different. You know, most of what we do is newsworthy, of course, because we have a really important mission. We hear that one a lot. We'll say, we'll meet with a potential client, nonprofit, and we'll say, well, what, you know, what kind of news do you think you have? And they'll say, well, our mission's really important to the community. I think that case can be made around the room. So what's the truth in that situation? Well, news stories can't just be about important stuff. News stories must be about something new. And they must prove an impact on people. And this is, I, I hope, a big takeaway for you today. And I hope to have the opportunity to mention this a few times in different ways. But the stories that are most memorable and the stories that have the most impact for your organization are the stories that are about people and the people who benefit from your organization and benefit from your mission. And it's really tough to tell that story in a press release. It's about the impact in the community and what's new and what ties into the news. And these are very sophisticated and nuanced ways of thinking. But I hope you'll understand it's not as simple as it's often made out to be, particularly in the dreaded marketing committee meetings that some of you have, where marketing committee members will say, well, we should put out a press release on this, or we're really important, so the media should be paying attention to us, or we should be more relevant because this is important. There's nuance here, there's sophistication, there's strategy, just like any other part of business when executed well. Here's another myth, one of our favorites. We've hired a PR firm, so we don't really need to do anything now. Get that one a lot. It's like, well, isn't that why we have you? So we don't have to think about this anymore? Myth. The truth is that PR is a contact sport. Bring your helmets. You need to be involved. So you may have a firm helping you out. If you do, thank you and congratulations. But you also need to be involved. You work in your organization every day. The firm does not. It needs to be a two-way street, exchange of communication, dual strategy development, and then the firm can do what they do best and leverage the relationships that they have. Um, but you still have to be involved. We've had clients over the years who act like when they hire us, they're flicking a switch, they turn on that machine, and they sit back and they watch it work. And the truth of the matter is it doesn't work that way. There has to be collaboration and involvement to make sure that this, the, the right stories are the ones that you're trying to get out there. Another myth, social media, by the way, has been a, a, a boon for the myth business in PR. And since the advent of social media, we've heard more myths than we had heard, I think, in all the years combined. This is one we're hearing a lot lately. You know, we have social media accounts, so we can crowdsource and we can raise money on social media. And it doesn't really work that way. The truth is that social media has to be managed and social media has to be grown. You know, we had a uh, nonprofit we started working with about a year ago, and we said, are you on social media? And they said, yeah, we are. And when we started working with them and we dug into it, what we realized is that they had set up accounts, but that was it. So that's like buying the gym membership at the beginning of the year, and in June saying, hey, I haven't lost any weight. Well, have you gone to the gym? Well, no, but I have a membership. <laughs> Very much the same thing. You have to nurture it grow it, manage it, and then also run it in concert with all your other communication platforms. And if and only if all those things are happening well, that investment can pay off and social media can play a role in fundraising. And that role that social media plays could be a whole half-day session here at this conference, but to put it succinctly, it's evolving. You have to keep an eye on it. You have to have multiple people monitoring trends and seeing what's working for other organizations and what might work for yours. A couple years ago, the hot new thing is um, 
you know, have a, a company that has a contest and they run it on social media and then you as their customer, you vote for which charity is the best charity that should get their money. Um, not a lot of that happening now because it really fatigued the audience for a couple of years. The retweet this and the charity will get $10 has been fatigued. The like this Facebook status and we'll give $5 to charity. Facebook doesn't really like that. They'd rather you give them $5 per like. And the audience has been a little bit fatigued. But you do see some occasions where engagement can happen in social media and relationships can be built and awareness can be built and there is development upside to it. But it's not instant gratification. So this stuff takes work and this stuff takes strategy. It's not as simple oh, as the myth where you know we're on there so you know we can we can start crowdsourcing and raising money. By the way, everybody loves this crowdsourcing thing now. There's Kickstarter, everybody wants a Kickstarter campaign. I'm a little worried that their fatigue is going to set in there too. So I think we need to keep a close eye on that. You know how how the younger generations are willing to give money over uh, over PayPal and have that transaction happen electronically, but you know, to how, to how much? Uh, how much is, is, is the limit before the audience finally gives up and says, you know what, go out and raise your own money. I, I don't know. Um, another myth we've been hearing for years and continue to hear is that news coverage sells tickets for events. Get us news coverage and we'll sell tickets for our event. That's a tough proposition because a lot of your events cost like $250 to go to. So, you know, Mr. and Mrs. Metro Detroit aren't just going to see that on TV and say, you know what, we're trying to figure out a way to get rid of 500 bucks this weekend. Let's go to that black tie event. doesn't really work that way. The truth is that people sell tickets to the events, particularly the big ticket events. We believe that news coverage can help provide some attention for that event and some attention for your mission and the event is a hook to do that. So we look at events as excuses to communicate. Events are opportunities to convey your mission to the community. And maybe it's a story on somebody who's benefited from your organization. Or maybe it's a feature story on your chair for the event to be able to tell their connection to the mission. Or maybe it's an opportunity to go on one of the local morning shows with a family who's been helped by your organization and tell the story because the event is a hook. The event's an excuse to do that. But if you're looking for PR to sell out a room, particularly at a high-end event, it's, it's just not going to happen. And hopefully your PR people are honest with you about that. Um, but event communication is something we continue to do a lot of for nonprofits. We just think about it differently. Another myth, we have an anniversary going on. You know, we're 50 years, this, uh, 50 years old this year, so that's got to be news. But we have a black tie gala. That's got to be news. Everybody's favorite. We have a golf outing. That's news. Or we have a fundraising walk coming up, so that's got to be news too. Um, I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, but I bet if you look at this list, 100% of you have at least one of those. I've had to tell clients before, you know, if you don't do a black tie event or a golf outing, they're not going to take away your 501c3. Really, they're not. You don't have to do these things. So these things are not inherently newsworthy. But the truth is that they can be excuses to communicate. You just have to take a different approach. So an anniversary in and of itself is not news. I mean, I think, you know, when, when Ford had that 100th anniversary back about 10 years ago, it was a great thing and the community got behind it. But what I think it did for a lot of organizations is it created this impression that anniversaries are newsworthy in and of themselves, and they're not. But they can be good excuses to communicate and good excuses to do some creative things with PR to rally around your organization and around its mission. You just have to plan ahead and think differently about it. So if, you, if your organization has an anniversary coming up in a couple of years, I'd say think about it now and think about how you might want to revolve some things around it from a communication standpoint, a fundraising standpoint. Again, black tie event, not news, but it, what kind of communications opportunity does it create? Um, and the golf outing, uh, good luck on golf outing. Uh, from a PR standpoint. I mean, we're getting now into the season where there's one or, two, one or two a day, every day, all benefiting good causes. How do you get attention for it? It's hard. Sell sponsorships, sell golfers, focus on that, try to make some money, and then any PR that can come from it um, is, uh, would be welcome. 
Uh, another myth, uh, and this one is, is a really scary one when we hear it, but we hear it um, from time to time. You know, donors will support us because donors are afraid of what could happen if we cease to exist. If we close our doors, if we can't raise this money, it's really bad for the community. So we need to get some PR around that so we can get support. And I think the most egregious example of this that I've seen, and I won't mention any names, but a few years ago there was an organization that was in some real financial trouble, as a lot of businesses for profit and nonprofit were. And they had a board member in the media uh, who hosted the radio show. And they convinced this board member to do a radio show to talk about how dire the situation was at this organization and how if the community didn't rally, this organization would cease to exist and what an awful thing that would be. And they spent an hour on the radio talking about this doomsday scenario. And they were able to raise enough money from the listeners to hit whatever number they needed to hit. Well, what do you do next year? What do you do the year after? You only get to do that once, if you ever do it at all. And I don't think this organization's still around. It, may have, it, was a, it was a quick fix. And we all know in businesses that quick fixes don't tend to work. So what do you do instead? Well, I, I think it's our experience in working with clients that donors and the audience overall, the public, really responds to successful organizations that use positive messaging and show their results in a powerful way, in a positive way. That's if and only if that audience is aware and fully understands who you are, what you do, how you're different, and why you're worthy of their stewardship. And I think this is really important because as times have been tough, we've almost gotten used to this new normal. You know, somebody said, well, flat is the new up. <laughs> we've, you know, we're, we're happy now if we're flat in our revenues over last year. So there aren't always great stories to tell financially. But if you go to the community and say, we need your help or else, the community has a great chance of choosing or else. If you go to the community and say, we're successful and we're doing good work and you want to continue to support us so we can do things like this and more, the public tends to respond to that. And I think this is the most important psychological change when we work with clients that we can help them with. Success breeds success. Fear brings unpredictable results at best. So we narrowed it down to those myths, and I hope I've cleared those up for you. Um, but I really want to spend most of the time engaging in discussion, because whenever I go to talk to a group, nonprofits in particular, about marketing and PR, I get a lot of questions because your organizations are different sizes, and some people are professionals on the inside or the outside, and some people are just trying to figure out how they can do this on their own and, and grow their organization. So I'd really like the opportunity to engage this group in a discussion and, and answer a few questions while we're here. Which means somebody has to go first. All right, I'll go first. Yes? So um, I have a board that sort of thinks of PR as like this investment, but you put you know, money in a snowball machine and something comes out. And so when they don't see, like you said, the ticket sales or the whatever come out, and they go, well, let's not do this anymore. So how do you tell them that, you know, it's sort of this long-term thing and you're establishing a presence and an identity with your PR that you hope translates to ticket sales at the bottom? Well, if we could figure, if anybody in here knows the answer to that question, I might hire you on the spot and have you come and talk to all of our clients. You know, our, our best clients understand that it's a long-term proposition. And we're talking, you know, th these things need repetition over periods of time. And it's incremental. Incremental can be very frustrating to boards in particular and to organizations that don't feel like they have the room to be incremental. Um, so I think you have to be able to look at things year to year. But I think the other thing that helps too is when we talk about multi-platform communications is we're not just communicating through the media anymore. Media still is a very credible, traditional media as we call it now, is very credible. They still maintain an audience and a level of respect in their coverage, but there are a lot of other ways to reach your audiences now. And I think the more platforms that we can provide, we as communicators can provide for the money we're being paid, the more value 
we bring to the organization. So I understand why it'd be frustrating if they said, well, you know, all we did was give a few articles and nothing really happened. Well, hopefully they should have been told on the front end that if all you get is a few articles, nothing's really going to happen. Um, it's about, you know, managing the expectation over long term, which can be difficult. And I think it's, you know, everybody in your business, you've got upsides and downsides. And one of the downsides in what we do is that um, it's, it's not a quick fix. Yes. I, I understand um, what what you're saying and what you what you just said. And um, over the years, I've had I've engaged in a number of PR professionals for my organization. What's your experience with how to best evaluate the outcomes of PR firms, PR freelancers? So the the question is about evaluating outcomes, and I recommend as much of a holistic approach as possible. So if you're looking at news coverage, for example, and you see what kind of coverage you get one year versus another year, that's one way of looking at it, although I think it does have to be graded on a curve. For example, if you get a great story from last year from a publication that no longer exists, and that happens sometimes, then that should be thrown out. Um, and that's just the, the way of the world. I think some of this has to be a, 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 a kind of a group dynamic, because a lot of what we try to create in PR for nonprofits to support fundraising you end up hearing about the results anecdotally. And that's hard to measure and it's hard to track because it's not scientific. But if you get the right people in a room and they say, you know what, I feel like when I'm out, more people know who we are. Or I feel like when I'm out, I say something and it, it kind of triggers something that it didn't use to. That's a sign of success from a communications standpoint. Um, some of this can be evaluated tangibly. You know, if you don't have a good e-newsletter that has credibility and readability that you're sending to your audiences this year, but you do next year, that's a step in the right direction. And you have to look at that as a communications tool. One of the things I wanted to make sure to communicate to you today is that, you know, we used to have to rely on a pretty good trade-off to get attention for our organizations. What we would do is we basically would make a deal with traditional media. And the deal was that we would give up some control of the message because they would tell the story their own way through their own editorial filter. But in exchange for that, we would get their audience. And we couldn't touch their audience because it was huge. And we still make that deal with them even though their audiences are smaller. We can now communicate to our audiences directly in very credible and in sometimes emotional ways without needing traditional media to do that. We have websites now where we can communicate directly. We have YouTube now where we can produce our own content. We have newsletters that we can send directly to the inboxes of our supporters and our audiences where we can tell our own stories in our own ways. And as long as it's credible and relatable, it can be effective as part of a bigger package. Social media fits into that category too. So to get back to your question, I think when you're evaluating these things, you know, Excel grids are not a good way to do it. That's not going to tell the whole story. I think you have to have a real conversation. And hopefully the people you're working with who are executing the PR can be candid enough and share your objectives enough to be able to provide the kind of evaluation that will be helpful for your organization. Yes? Uh, you mentioned trends in social media and monitoring them. What kind of things should you be looking for other than number of likes? Is there anything that stands out? Yeah, I mean, I, I heard a great analogy about number of likes. You know, the, 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 the like is like somebody who drives by and honks the, horns and honks the horn and wave. Doesn't mean they didn't see you. So I, I think, you know, one of the things that nonprofits do, the same as for-profits, but we see it a lot in nonprofits, is they get a little bit myopic about their own mission on social media. And it's like, you know, we're, we're really, all we have time to do is our own social media. What I would say is, you know, follow everybody you can and like everybody you can so you can keep an eye on what other people are doing. And sometimes the best ideas are out there right in front of you. You just have to pay attention to it. So if you see something, it's like, wow, they really nailed it. They really encapsulated their mission. They really got people involved. They got people to click something. You know, I think that matters. I think the other thing to do, too, that a lot of organizations don't do, because IT people hold this very close to the vest, is keep an eye on your analytics for your website. So IT people like to hold that analytics very closely. 
And I think the development people need to have access to that. Because what that will tell you is how social media is leading traffic to the website, which is something that you want because that means they're engaging more deeply with your organization. And by the way, the, the, the good analytics stuff is all free. Google Analytics, they, they do that. They, they kind of give it to you with a password. So there's no reason why your IT people shouldn't share it with you. You just have to ask them. And so I, I can think of one of our nonprofit clients in particular that's really learned a lot since they got a hold of that. And they're saying, well, you know, we're not getting a lot of likes and we're not getting a lot of retweets, but wow, people are starting to click our site. And once they get there, they're clicking around and they're learning more about us. Well, if I, that's a win from a PR standpoint. Yes? Congratulations. That's a 30, for those who are in here, a 35 to 50 percent open rate on uh, eBlast. That's great. Yeah. Well, I, and I also have a store, and that only gets 25 to 30 percent. Oh, that's pretty good. But how do you translate that into sales? Or how do you know what it is? So, I, you know, you just have to look at best practices in marketing. So, you know, we're doing cartwheels about 20 percent, generally, with clients, um, because we all get a ton of email. So the fact that somebody was able to open it and go through that at that kind of rate, you should feel really good about. And that also means that they like what you're sending. So one of the things that that teaches you is you're right on in your content. And then you have to decide, do I do this more often or do I leave it where it is? And even within that content, can you give them something to click? Can you ask them to forward? Can you do more with it? So you know, it's hard to answer that question out of context. But I can tell you, even out of context, that that's a very good open rate. So the next challenge for you is, okay, these people are reading our stuff. Now what do we want them to do with it?